Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Rise Every Day Shit. As always, we got a special guest in the building. Y'all might see this brother doing his poetry around town somewhere. I want to introduce to y'all, we got my brother Shane Amir with us. Uh, and he's going to drop some knowledge about what he's been working on, what he's doing. And we just going to have some real talk, barbershop style. Shane, <laughs> welcome to the show, my brother. Thank and you, for you. those people who have not had the pleasure of meeting you and work with you, uh, t- tell us, who is Shane Amir? Sheesh. Shane Amir <laughs> is, a, is a guy, man, a guy with a vision. No, I mean, uh, r- really, man, I'm just your, your average guy from Brooklyn. Brooklyn, um, I'm a poet. I started writing poetry when I was kind of in middle school. Um, started performing a little bit when I was in middle school. And from right. there, I just went on to do other stuff. But I like to look at myself as a creator. Right. Right. I mean, poetry is the real truth tellers and the creators. I've been telling people that all along. So, I mean, how did you really get into poetry, though? Like, did, did somebody sign you up for a competition and you just you just said, tell me when to go? Tell me when to go. Then you started to hit the flow. <laughs> how, how did you get into it? <laughs> that is so... Um, I didn't think that's some like Nardwar. <laughs> since, since you since you brought it up, uh, I think I've never really think I ever told this story before. It was not so people were there, but Ooh, yeah, like in eighth grade, I was in the back of class, and um, I don't know why we did it, but all the boys in the back room we just started putting aura gel on our lips so that we couldn't speak. Like so, uh-huh. like our social studies teacher would never call on us. Uh, uh, I get in trouble, and instead of going to detention, you know, my social studies teacher, Ms. Nelson, uh, she uh-huh. signed me up for an uh, open mic. It was actually a hip-hop competition, uh-huh. but I didn't rap. So when I came on stage, I just was like the only person that wasn't up there rapping. And I went, I performed for the first time in my city, uh, like March 2010. And uh-huh. here it was... Well, yeah, someone really did sign me up. Like, she just signed me up. Like, that's actually crazy that she knew that. I know. That's like serendipity. I, we did not have this conversation, y'all, beforehand. We had some other conversations, but it wasn't about that. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Miss Nelson for signing you up. And now look at look look at it. It's it's turned into a a, a passion. It's turned into the ability to do this uh somewhat as a career and uh tell us how that process has been like i uh you know not too many people get to like turn something that they that they love and enjoy in a passion or or as a creative like what is it like to be able to as a creative you know take something from a concept and then um use it uh to you know fuel your 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 wildest dreams and 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 uh, get you know the business side of things of, of being a creative. Like, be honest with us too, because we know I know some creators they come in here and give all the <laughs> the fluff, but they don't tell like, oh man, the struggle is real trying to be a creative and trying to get your thing out there. <laughs> no, no, I mean I, I, I'll be honest. I, everybody's process is a lot different. Um, specifically when it comes to actually creating whatever it is that they're doing. Um, my process was a lot of uh long nights. Because uh, I really got on that business side and started going full throttle when I was in college. So mm-hmm. balancing that undergrad and classes was a lot. Um, mm-hmm. But more than anything, I think it's kind of like magic. When you're doing certain things or creating certain things, you honestly do have to see it first. Mm-hmm. So I've never really created anything that I, I couldn't see. Um, mm-hmm. And it was really it was really like jumping and not knowing if your parachute was going to open or not. Um, that's that's how it was for me in undergrad. I'm not I'm not sure if we talked too much about uh, my undergrad when we did speak. I'm not I'm not too sure. Did nah, it? tell 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 us about undergrad, like starting out as a creative and then uh, going through school and and what 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 was it like? Uh, what 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 were you able to create during that time? Was it more so like a lot of different poetry and then you were before that poetry, or did you create like actual product? Around well, was... kind of both. Okay. Um, so when I was an undergrad, I was I started off releasing my poetry on Twitter. I would just okay. write the poem down. I had a specific, unique type of uh, 
like a like a the pen the penmanship i can't think of the name mm-hmm. like the scripture or whatever i had a specific ink that i would use mm-hmm. and then i would just post it on twitter and after that i kind of uh just started selling my own poetry frames i wanted people to have them in their houses so i was like mm-hmm. on co- on campus in my college dorm room spray paint i was probably super illegal to have spray paint on a college campus i had <laughs> spray paint i had brought these frames and i was in the room spray painting the frames different mm-hmm. styles and different colors um i had gotten this old 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 parchment paper kind of like what you would see on like the independence documents and oh wow um i was burning those in a certain way it smelled terrible too i mean i was just putting them in the frames and i was selling them i was going door to door literally like selling them whoever wanted them i was selling them for like 40 dollars each and um yeah that's i was working at the gym too so like you working at the gym too doing this so you was going to school working at the gym yeah, you was you was hustling poetry out the back of your trunk like Master P, <laughs> and you was working as, man. Yeah, man, was the gym was the gym wasn't cutting it, man. The gym wasn't cutting it, man. I probably was seeing like maybe like two hundred and eighty dollars every two weeks. It was uh, crazy. So man. when it was time to go to spring break, I really wanted to go, and it was me and my friend Austin. And he wanted me to come out of mm-hmm. Miami. And I was just like, I gotta, I gotta get some money before we go to Miami. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I just started selling my poetry frames and um, connecting with people, uh, meeting different types of people that I used to uh, walk by on Man. campus, became my friends. Uh, and it was really, really like a beautiful thing. Yeah, I love the idea of the poetry frames. Um, how did you come up with that idea? Like, that's a, a beautiful and brilliant concept. And just the way that you put it all together, using that old, old paper, like to give it that 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 certain type of style, look and feel uh, uh, of like, like this ancient text uh, and nostalgia. Like, <laughs> uh, like, like, how did that whole idea come to be? I think it's, I've always felt, I'm not going to say some people have always told me this, but I've always felt like I've had a really old soul, like kind of just never really went or bl- mm-hmm. never really blended in, I guess, with the people that were around me. So I wanted to try to do something that I know would stand out. I don't mm-hmm. like people to feel like when they're buying something from me, I'm just um, taking their money. I want them mm-hmm. to feel like they are always going to be a point, uh, a part of this moment in time. Like that's a moment in time. I'll never sell those frames again. It'll never look mm. like that again if I do sell them again. So anyone that has that is a part of like this specific moment in my mm. journey. That's one thing that I learned just being in college and I mean, not being popular, I would say, but just knowing a lot of people. Like you meet people at different points of their lives. So Nah. So, so yeah. it's like this is like a limited edition. So if you got that first edition, whoo. Yeah. That's that's a masterpiece right there. Yeah, I used to worry about that a lot. I'm like, dang, should I get enough? And I, I don't, I'm not gonna say I do it intensely, but I'm like, should I get a lot of, should I sell a lot of like these crossword books for, uh, should I get a lot? Should I get like a thousand orders or should I just make it in a rare quantity so that it's kind of limited edition? Um, Man. but I try, I try to have enough for everybody. I don't try to do it intentionally. I try to have enough for people to, you know, Always, Man. always get it. Man, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I admire and I, I mean, it depends on which way business model you want to do, but I do like the nostalgia factor of like this, this, this original timepiece and period of time. Like, uh, like it's like an experience almost. Like you can't experience, you can't re-experience this. Like once a, once a, a, a piece of a moment has happened in time, you can't re-experience it the same way as the people who originally experienced it so like yeah it, there's just some there's some essence to that right i don't know if that's what you were going for but I definitely I essence like in that because yeah. you got you think about it right and what i what that does for other people is just unless you have this collectible unless you have this item that was a one and done but also what that does and i learned this from the older generations of my family is it allows those people to then become storytellers right they were there when these things were happening. They were, you know, my mom used to talk about seeing TLC before they were mm-hmm. famous and seeing all these people outside on the sidewalk. You know, she has a different story. She has a different perspective. And I want those people to have that story too. Like, you know, they can mm-hmm. say, oh, I remember when Shane had on, 
Mitch Max socks walking around campus trying to give out poetry frames or whatever, but somebody else that was there may see it differently. So mm-hmm. it's all beautiful at the end of the day. Yeah, it is. It yeah. is. And, and, you know, speaking of elders and, and, and time and history, because I know you brought up TLC in the, in the earlier part of our conversation. Actually, I think it was before we even got on. We talked about how we uh, you being from New York. I was born in New York. Um, I know you in Texas now, but uh, I, I'm thinking about uh, 50 years of hip hop. I really remiss because hip hop, um, even your whole story, like you. You, Miss Nelson got you into this hip hop competition. You didn't rap, but you did the poetry. But how you know rap, hip hop, and poetry all kind of was a part, part of that whole art form and culture during that time frame. And we in fifty years of hip hop, and I know New York is heavy. New York is the mecca of this thing. <laughs> uh, how how do you feel? You know, hip hop has influenced you in your poetry, or just and and also in general, New York. Like, how how does New York, the New York epicenter and the culture of New York and New York hip hop influence poetry? Man, that is so. <laughs> I'm starting to think you're doing this on purpose, but that's actually very interesting <laughs> that you say that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna release. I know we talked a little bit about the book or whatever the case would be. My my book that's coming out is actually a poetry book and it's a hip hop poetry book. And it's interesting that you talk about this 50 years of, of hip hop thing, because that is something that I've been thinking about a lot while I've been working on that project. Um, I saw an interview with Bow Wow and he has mm-hmm. said that he feels like, Oh, hip hop is coming back and that he hopes that it starts to come back and et cetera. I'll, I'll be honest and say that the music today, I don't really listen much to um is not necessarily what i grew up on i'm not that old i'm only 26 mm-hmm. but uh i think that the music today is really really um more violent than what i'm used to seeing growing up mm-hmm. and um when you talk about my influence growing up i had different sounds uh, and it was everywhere not just in hip-hop but also in the media too one of my favorite movies is brown sugar I don't know if you've mm, ever seen Brown I Street. love that movie. Yeah. And you know how they start off and they're in the park and uh and just like Common had that whole I like, guess yes, yes job and you don't stop. It's not like that anymore. Hey. Now, I think hip hop now is in a way promoting or encouraging people to glorify the environments that they're in instead of trying to find a way out of it. And I didn't really understand until I started to listen to the music today, how powerful the music was back then. Um, Like Nas, when Nas did, I know I can. And he had all these little kids out here in the street and they were, had a positive message. They had a vision. They had, you know, I don't think I see those same things now with the children today when they're in the videos and doing the things that they're Mm -hmm. doing. So, it's weird, but in a way, I think that the music today is kind of what's pushing me to continue doing what I'm doing because I, there are kids that don't relate to the things that they are that is being talked about in the sounds and songs today, and there are kids that relate and don't want to relate anymore to the things that are being said today. Um, so, nah, I don't know. Yeah, no, I I love the way you put that because you said. It's to glorify it. And, and I think the generation, because I'm a little older than you, like the generation I come from of hip hop, when we talked about violence and so forth and stuff like that in the neighborhood, it was to educate like, and, and to to bring awareness to what's going on in the hood so, and, and, and try to say, hey, this is what's going on in my hood. Like how do, and, and how do we move past and move forward this and and don't don't come over here to get trapped in this right, right. uh it's like hope said that nah, hope hope did that so hopefully you wouldn't have to, go, have through to go through that, that. Yeah. yeah yeah you know so that's yeah. what we I just listened that's to that one that's crazy <laughs> yeah <laughs> love that blueprint man and, and right, I think right? they're confusing us now because think about it right you have people like I won't say anybody name but you have some rappers rapping about doing the things that they do to other people 
But then these same rappers are the ones that are being invited into the schools to speak to people. These are the the moguls, right? Mm-hmm. And I just think it sends a, a really messed up message to the youth outside of the obvious, which is telling them that, you know, it's okay to do all of this. I think the other one is telling the youth, like, when you look, when you're looking for role models, these are, these are what your role models should look like. I don't think mm-hmm. that's the case. We got two guys like you and I. Why are we not getting invitations up to schools at all? Mm-hmm. You know, Man. so yeah. and and you know, me and my my boy was having a, a more like hood scholar conversation about this, and we he's like, you know, what it is is like our generation. We had the dope boys and hustlers that were being glorified, but the if you think about what the dope boy and hustlers did, they they was they was selling drugs so that they can get out of the circumstances and put people on because that's the only way they could do it, right? And, and then this next this next wave of hip hop folks are the drug users and the drug abusers, uh, and they they just about party women. They they, they not they not like. There's not, there's no consciousness to it, right? Not at all. And we yeah. we lost all the conscious rappers, and, and then also in our generation we had the dope boys, which we love, like, and we had the conscious rappers, right? And, and then somewhere we lost the conscious rappers, the dope boys, we love, and now we got this era of like just, I don't know, we just we, we on lean, we on we on we getting trippy, we just like eh, I don't know what it is, like, and then I'm not about that at, at this age in my life, and then I mean. It's cool to party and have fun. I, I'm, I'm not saying don't do that, but where where is the balance of the consciousness and and the 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 uplifting and the, and all the rest of the stuff, right? Uh, I, like uh, like Lauren Hill in one song, I was listening to Miss Education of Lauren Hill. I need that. Come on, baby, light my fire. Like <laughs> everything you drop is so tired. Music is supposed to inspire. How can we not yeah. get no higher? Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And it's so interesting because a lot of that stuff is really a facade. Like it was a, uh, I seen an interview the other day where someone said that they, or Nicki Minaj was saying she spoke to Future and Future was saying that he actually doesn't even really do hardcore drugs. I and saw that like, too. Man. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so why are you rapping about it then? Because it inspires other people to do that. When you have, when you have the control of just the, ultimately the youth, but just the world in general, when you have them by that, that, that threshold, you can ultimately mm-hmm. influence them to do anything that they that they tell you to do like i think the musicians and stuff those are the real social media influencers not the youtubers not the like they're Mm -hmm. actually influencing people on social media to do these things to post Mm -hmm. these things and yeah so i i I come from those places i'm not from like a rich high ceiling door doorbell place in brooklyn like i'm from one of the I would believe one of the most dangerous parts of Brooklyn. And mm-hmm. I have friends that didn't get the same opportunities that I had had. And I have friends that are still in these places that don't want to be there. So I know firsthand yeah. that everyone that's there is not happy about it. And yeah. I think it's just our job, like for people like you and I to continue to show those people who are not happy about it, that there's another way. Yeah. And, in, in- in your humble opinion, do you think people in your generation are starting to wake up and get woke to it? And and um, do you see like you know the YouTubers and the poets like yourself starting to have with with these different platforms that you can come on more of a, a, a influence to counteract that 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 negative influence or or uh. portrayal? I I want to say that I feel like I see some of um the people in my generation waking up to the things that are going on. It's it's honestly hard because they don't understand necessarily what addiction is. They don't understand how you can be addicted to platforms and mm. so I think that because they may not directly be doing what is talked about in the songs or in the music or just in general, I, being a consumer of something that is 
promoting a bad message is just as bad as following along with that message, if mm. that makes sense. Um, mm. And what was your second question? You said, do I think that... Do, I, do, I, do you think that, you know, the YouTubers, the creators of the generation of poets like yourself can um, help to counteract some of that 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 negative messaging to to bring more light bring more awareness bring more clarity bring more conversation um i think there needs to be more there needs to be a lot a lot lot more um i'm really like an organic soul like i don't really watch a lot of things that a lot of other people watch like the things that i watch are kind of like youtube like youtube uh couples like mm -hmm. we're saying Quan or two people, they are like alumni of my school. I like to watch them because they have a happy family and a happy home. Mm -hmm. I just think that everywhere we look, certain industry is always being tainted with someone that's here to promote a negative message. Mm -hmm. If people go back to what I believe is the best route and that's independence, then I think that we have a better chance. I think everyone is either pushing to, to make music good enough to get a deal but not to make music good enough to mm. you know be seen as someone that's really talented i think that fame and excellence mm. have completely become disconnected mm. people in today's world don't necessarily um aspire to be masters at their craft they aspire to be good enough to be famous or mm -hmm. become a celebrity or become an influencer or for a blue check. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I re when you really, really, really think about it in this core, the people who are truly passionate about what they're doing and not passionate about the outcomes of what they're doing, I think those will be the people that we will eventually see start take over, start to take over. I'm not sure when though. Yeah. But, yeah. But, I, I I totally agree with that. I love the way you broke it down. You know, it kind of goes me back, goes back to what you were saying about, um, you know, being addicted, right? Like we're, we're like being addicted to these social media platforms, being addicted to like drugs, like uh, fame is a uh, an addiction too. Like uh, this is all dopamine, right? That that's been being feed fed into this generation, and the more you feed into that dopamine of these different things that you're intaking, you know, whether you become a drug addict or not, you you become an addict of these things, and your lifestyle starts to portray, or you start to unconsciously, you know, walk in this type of direction. So, yeah, you know, be careful what you 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 get addicted to it which you start to feed into and, and i like that you 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 follow things like that high school couple who have a positive that that helps feed your your psych psychology and, and that, that's what i hope to do with this with this platform too is like i'm taking all the different amazing black people i see doing things so just like Nas is i know i can so people these kids can see and be something other than what they're fed to media, um, because it's it's hard to be what you can't see, right? But now yeah. that we have this, and I'm hoping also with this platform, we can unite, uplift, and ignite each other in in, in the more of a you know positive aspiration of what we want to see in our community. And I'm hoping that I get more yeah. people like you to share your story. And you got to stick with it. You will definitely get more people to come on and want to share their story. You have to stick with it because. When you have a genuine message like that, like I said, that concept like of your parachute opening first, it might it might not open. I remember, I remember I would post my poems and I had deep messages in some of my poems about America mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. And I would get like 12 likes. Mm -hmm. And I just, just was like, man, y'all don't get it. I'm trying to, you know, this is not just poetry. I have a message that I'm trying to get, but some, some messages take a while. That's one thing I learned. Mm -hmm. I know we spoke about like books and poetry and stuff like that. A lot of a lot of times, especially in books, like you mm -hmm. don't see people become you see people become bestsellers now way earlier than they mm -hmm. became bestsellers before. Like Man. some good books suck for the author to die. But <laughs> you become a good mm -hmm. book. I hate to say it, but like when the great when S. Scott Fitzgerald was here and he wrote the Greek Gatsby, mm -hmm. people didn't care. People didn't care. Not to the extent mm -hmm. that they care now, right? I mean, times mm -hmm. are also different then, but I think things just take time, and I, I've come to that. Man. I've come to that realization too. 
Yeah. And I, and I think and I think because we we now are in that generation of that 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 microwave generation like they the they, the generation that don't like sit that. through <laughs> yeah. uh, the generation that that, that like my, my daughter right like she 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 don't know what sit through a commercial is like why do i gotta like if we ever go well, sometimes we we have we i'll be watching a game or watching something on live tv she's like could we just skip this like why why we sit through a commercial like uh, this that's, is live tv this is how it yeah. works like <laughs> that's all technology man i'll tell you gotta think about it you can get you can download music a, a three minute song or download in like 15 seconds you can get on the internet quick you can talk to your friends quick you can get fast food fast that's usually already cooked by the time you get there like mm-hmm. people, it's, everything is just so fast now people have kind of like lost that uh that keep your head down and work and grind, or just mm-hmm. that only that overall aspect of patience. They and and I and I think that's the disappointment of it because you don't allow t- things to maturate. Like if you think okay. about like because I got my 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 grandparents are from the south, right? Okay. Um, and and you may know this Texas people like who still got you know some of the OGs around that do home cooking. If you look at a home cooked yeah. meal that's fresh, like Yo, that thing take all day to make. Like Ooh, they yeah. chopping up the ingredients, <laughs> they marinating and stuff. Like it's it's oven slow cooked, right? Yeah. And, and and then you 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 finally bite it to you like, mm, man, why this why did it taste so good? Because it took all day to cook. It took yeah. it, it, the, the the you take some good home cooking that took all day to cook that had to be in the microwave. Definitely the reason why it tastes so good. Cause a whole lot of love and care and seasoning and and, and match preparation yeah. and maturation and then I didn't even the, think about and, that though. I think fast man. food is an addiction too. Mm. I'm not gonna lie. Well, let me tell you. I'll be honest though. I'll be honest. I we all have our vices. When I had moved from NY to North Carolina first, because I was in NC, mm-hmm. and the part of NY I was in, they didn't have Chick Fil A. So I got to North Carolina, mm-hmm. I'm literally like right around the corner from Chick-fil-A. Like I was mm-hmm. I was getting on my bike, I was leaving my dad house, I was getting on my bike, I was just going to Chick-fil-A, drive through on a bike, man. I don't know. It was something wow. that was so good about it. And I think the best part about it was that I didn't have to wait. And then when I started to realize that, I'm like, oh, they get in my pockets. Mm-hmm. They get in my mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like that, that that easy satisfaction. The easy satisfaction and and the food is not as even as nutritional uh, and as good as a home cooked meal. And if they gotta put that as one hundred percent anything, is yeah, you know. We already know. We already know. (laughs) Look, look. Oh, what people? What thing the people don't know? Especially speaking about food, he, my, my, my brother is getting some good maturation. Everybody knows I I got Nigerian roots, but he got a he. We was talking. your, your girlfriend Nigerian, so yeah. he got that jello rice now, you know, <laughs> and, the, and the and the chicken stew, so he 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 can leave Chick Fil A alone. We we trade in his Chick Fil A for some some jello rice and, yeah. and and some chicken stew. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait, what else have you tried, Nigerian? Have you tried any other Nigerian other Nigerian food? Egusi, I love Egusi. What you got um, the Egusi? All right, pounded yam. I, I, I'm a real. I'm. A, I am a little bit of a picky eater. I'll say that I'm a really. I'm a little bit of a picky eater, but yeah. um, I love soups though. Like whatever types of soup. Like I love soups. Um. So yeah, I'm making a homemade Lay. chicken soup tonight. So. Yeah. Well, not Nigerians. We we big on our stews, so you you gonna get a lot of different stews. And, and, <laughs> and so, uh, I, I'm glad I, I'm glad you you like the igusi. Uh, you know, some people they, they don't like the igusi, but I like the igusi too, and it's and it's nutritious for you <laughs> and delicious. Yeah, yeah it's so, good. Yeah. You know, before we get too far uh, along in the uh, you know all things Nigerian culture and 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 more food because. I'm gonna I'm get hungry here in a bit. <laughs> Let's talk about this book, man. I, I know you 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 pre told us a little bit about it. Tell us the process. Tell us what is the book. What was the process like in creating this book? Yeah. Um, and, and and what you hope people to get from it. Whew. I'm not gonna lie. Um, all right. So the name of my the name of my upcoming book is called Amir's Instant Poetry. Mm-hmm. Um. It's my debut poetry book. And man, the thing about creating is that like these things really become a part of you. So it's kind of like, mm. hard. it's like sending your kid to school for the first time. 
Like I, like yeah. I have to like let this book go and let it out into the world, and now everyone else is going to hold some of the most like intimate parts of my life. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, Amir's instant poetry. It, I've been working on it for about three years now. I think around this month makes like the three year mark. It's been a lot. It's a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of poetry going on in there. A lot of poetry. I want to say it's about 150 to like 175 poems confirmed mm. and then we have okay. other ones that are just like all right here on the whiteboard and we're still trying to draw through it um i originally yeah. previewed the book and the last project that i dropped which was a crossword book i don't think i have any copies in here with me um, mm. No worries. You going you have to send us a I, picture and we'll put the picture. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Right here. This is actually a, a version that I don't think anyone's seen. But um originally it is started off as you know my uh, 2000s Blackberry uh -huh. poetry. So I, just I like had, that. Took a bunch of poems and Look, uh, a lot of people don't even know what Blackberry is. Well, the Blackberry Black is, is the right? best. One of the, the, the <laughs> one of the best full yeah. keyboard I, I just saw a comedian post about. I was like, man, Bl BlackBerry had the first BBMs and and, and, and Insta yeah. before Insta was Insta. Like we 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 were sad to see BlackBerry go, but let me I digress. It was a Black time. Was it was definitely a, it was time, a time. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So this next book, Amir's Instant Poetry, is it's, it's my baby. It's my debut poetry book. Um, I don't want to go too much into it. I really do want people to be surprised when they read it, but it's kind of like we talked about this concept of a moment. Um, anyone who decides to partake in this journey with, you know, me and, you know, support this book is not only getting the book, but to get in the piece of my life forever. I've been writing poetry since I was about 13 years old, and I've been releasing poetry since I was about 18 years old so one thing i wanted to do with this book was draw us all back to some of the happier times in our lives mm. um i went through like a phase where i just i went on myspace went to go look for my myspace page and my myspace page wasn't there anymore then i went mm. to look for my bebo page and that wasn't there anymore so what i really wanted to do was take some of these songs from my childhood some bow wow songs some uh, I got some old school Jay Z songs in there. Kanye West, uh, Ja Rule and Ashanti. Turn some of these poems, some of these songs into poems, and mm -hmm. tell a little bit of my story. Took some good movies that I had, uh, watched some cartoons that were a major part of my childhood and the happier days of my life. And I really just wanted to find a way to get everyone to connect together mm. um and i knew it was possible to do that with this type of book mm. and like i said i'm excited poetry has always been my passion i think it's a extremely saturated market now in the book sphere mm. but knowing that i think that's why i was in the lab so long working for as long as i've been working because i needed to find a different way to uh reach reach people and, mm. and, and to express my style of poetry. So, so yeah. I love it. I love it. And see, that's, 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 that's how you unite people right there. Right. With that connection piece. And I, I, I love, I love to hear it. Um, man, like you, gonna, you gonna send so many of us through like a state of nostalgia, um, and, and good times, good utopia feelings. And uh, hopefully we can create something, you know, beautiful out of that. See, look at look at that. Fifty years of hip hop. See, hip hop. This is what we this is what we did. This is what we, <laughs> we helped create hip hop. No, seriously. I think, it, man. I I listened to some of these songs and I kind of just started getting a little bit like sad. You know, like. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. I I think this is this is not even I think this one this one is gonna be special. Like this yeah. book is gonna be something that changes the world forever. We've never seen anything like this, and it's not because I'm doing it. And right. I'm just being honest, like what I'm about to do and what I'm about to release, like we've never seen anything like this. Right. And um, I think it's important that we all prepare for, 
you know, this moment, like I said, as best as we possibly can, because right. um, the moments come and go, but the memories last forever. And right. I think that this book is going to truly, 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 it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna make some noise. And right. as much as I'm ready for it, I hope everybody else is ready for it because I'm not, I'm not. It, it, like, look, I'm here look, for good this time. If they, if they ain't ready for it, like Coach Prime said, they better get ready. They better get ready. Because I'm gonna forget. It's no longer, it's, it's no longer we coming. We here. Yeah, yeah. And it's personal. It's, no, it's a, I'm not gonna lie. Like, the, and that's the thing too. As a as a writer, as an author, poet, whatever you want to call it, I think I grew up playing ball in New York City. Uh-huh. So I think just having a competitive nature is something that's embedded in me. And uh-huh. I don't I, I don't know if people kind of feel like in the book world that there isn't any competitors or that there isn't like, but no, I, I understand exactly what I'm up against. I understand mm-hmm. what I have, what I have on my resume, what I have on my portfolio. And just from a creative standpoint, I really did want to set the bar really high for anyone else that decided to, you know, try and make another poetry book. I don't, I don't think that I don't think that this one will ever be duplicated. It's it's yeah. it's impossible. I, yeah, I don't think so too. But I think you're at that that moment in life, and I'm appreciating this moment right now that I, I'm having with you, because there's there's moments in your life that turned into movements. And I think this is a moment that's about to turn into a movement. Like if you even, uh, I know I just, you know, quoted Coach Prime and all of that. And, and you know, uh, Deion Sanders had a moment with Jackson State University with with whatever happened with the fallout that that yeah. moment turned into something that led him to go over to Colorado, which is now, turned into a movement right and that's crazy, see how the energy yeah. and shift that changed in the movement so uh I, i'm thankful and grateful that i get to be a part of this moment with you and once this book hits that's going to turn into a movement I, I just i feel it deep down in my soul that this yeah. is about to turn into a movement and i can't wait to see this beautiful movement ignite to what it is so yeah. thank you i appreciate you and, and you know yeah. i'm a, i'm gonna be first in line to grab me a copy boy I, i'm gonna i'm gonna need i'm gonna need me a copy i'm gonna put my 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 dion shades in the copy of the book like hey we here <laughs> yeah. and then listen this is a this is an exclusive right here i haven't told anybody but make sure that when i'm t- anybody watching this make sure that when that link drop you get it because I, yeah. I always get DMs. I always get messages. I, I'm t- it's even family members that can't even get it in time. I'm not even gonna lie to you. And I'm doing mm-hmm. something different with this one. This is this first drop is a first edition exclusive. So once yeah. this one, and, I'm and out. we're gonna drop oh, the never. link right here in the bo- in the bio. Yeah. As soon as you, if you are listening to this and you looking at this right now, you seeing this, the link is in the bio. Grab you a copy. Support. Pull up. Post. And, and however you feel, whatever you feel, let, let release that into the world so we can create this movement. We 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 on a new one. We on the we we here, baby. We on a right. new one. So I, yeah. I'm a, I'm gonna rep this as much as I can. I want you to rep it too, cause we 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 done with the dumb stuff from 2000 and uh, let's 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 get with some unity. Let's get with some forward progress. Let's get some, with some more consciousness, and let's elevate each other For and sure. celebrate each other. Sure. Um, man, all right, let me because I, I don't want to do the Joe Rogan type podcast where we're going on forever. <laughs> I don't want that. Like, I want I want them to feel inspired and want to give them some t- factual knowledge and so forth. So, mm-hmm. I, I want to go through some some technical things just to kind of you know, uh, go through the journey of you and where you got to with this with this process of being who you are today. That that and I like going through this because, uh, you know, sometimes when I used to go speak out at the different schools to the young folks, they don't understand that your favorite poet, your favorite rapper and so forth. This, there was a journey before they became who they became. Right. Um, they think they think you just graduate from college and boom, you you start off with that six figure job or career because you got it all together. and You got the vision. You had the education. No, it don't work like that. Like this process is right. Like I've had jobs uh-huh. before this, before I became this. So I like to always ask this question to the guests. What was your first job? My first job was working um, summer youth employment, and I was like a, a kids counselor. I was in the, I was, they had the street blocked off. Uh-huh. I would just be in the street, 
and uh, just watching like these little kids. They would come kick me, beat me up, like just do whatever <laughs> they want. They played basketball. It was so no, they were so rude. And then when they found out I didn't live in Harlem, they would just treat uh-huh. me like crap. Like uh, yeah, it was. But that was that was my first job. That was my first job. I was in tenth grade. Uh-huh. Um. Yeah, and that just opened my eyes up a lot. <laughs> right. You know, you know, you know, Harlem folks crazy. always like to give, you know, anybody that ain't from Harlem problems. Like, yeah. you, I mean, you even see the rappers, uh, Harlem rappers, they always, they always talk bad about BK rappers, talk about Harlem, always talk about they more flashy and more fly. Um, yeah. I mean, we we all saw the locks and dips that. We yeah. all I'll saw what t- happened there. I will say, though, <laughs> people, my guys from Harlem, they know how to dress. They know Man, how to dress. Like, they my, do. My, my, yeah, yeah. But that was, that was like, my, that was my first job. Um, and then, I guess that was kind of like high school. My first real job was um, actually... I got my first real, real job. I, I say real because it was in my field. I actually got my first job in college from, from writing. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. Like I told you, I had been writing for like five years, just releasing my stuff. And then mm-hmm. one day I had got invited to a, a invite only writer's class for my senior year of college. Mm-hmm. And when we were in the summertime, he sent out email out saying, okay, everyone needs to write a story and bring it to class on the first day. And I'm like, he, he didn't give he didn't give us any no title, no like genre, nothing. So he just said, write a story. Ended mm-hmm. up writing this story online, um, writing this story on on my Google Drive. And I was so nervous about bringing it to class. I was like, you know, I only have like maybe like 300, 350 followers, something like that. Let me just post it on Twitter and see what the see what my friends on Twitter think. Mm-hmm. Woke up the next day and that tweet ended up going viral, and wow. someone from the yeah, it was a, it was a crazy time, man. Right. Crazy time. That was October like twenty seventeen, and right. then um, my someone from the University Alumni Association, um, Miss Snyder, mm-hmm. Stephanie Snyder, she reached out to me, and she asked. She said that she's read the story, mm-hmm. and she asked me to come by, and I went by to the office, and we spoke. And she asked me, you know, what what did I want to do? She was like, is there anything that you want to do with your writing? Um, I'm just, she just was honestly inspired and blown away. And she offered me an internship for my last year of undergrad, which wow. honestly became like my job. I was there every day. I was, uh, I worked on the school magazine. Yeah. And it was so crazy because the year after that, I, I still published my first book in 2018. Mm-hmm. And then in 2019, I ended up being featured in the magazine after I graduated as one of like the university's most notable authors. I think like the youngest person. Man, on that is a beautiful story, man. Like, look at like you stuck with it. You got this opportunity. Shout out to all those people that gave you the opportunity. But you seized the yeah. opportunity too to take the opportunity to get out there, and and each step kind of led you to where you're at today. Like when you think about it, like say, I know there's going to be a lot of young people who hear this and they're going to get inspired. Like, yeah, you know what? You know, I, I, I've been writing in my, my journal or my book and that is something I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to, I've been to a couple of school things here and there, um, but they have not took writing seriously as a career for whatever reasons. Um, uh, but they aspire to do what you're doing right now. What what would what would be some advice that you would give to them that you think has helped you be successful at taking the next step at being a um you know getting that first first real job as a writer and then also becoming more professional with your your poetry career. Enjoy it while 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 you're not a professional. That's that's I think that's the best <laughs> advice that I have because it's not saying that when you become a professional. It's bad, but it's that autonomy, like having the control of everything that you want to write and everything that you want to say is is beautiful. And you won't realize that you have that until someone strips it away, until you Mm -hmm. sign a contract, until you are now under someone else's watch. When I was writing Mm -hmm. for that magazine, there were certain things that I wanted to write in a certain manner. And she gave me the option to do that because I was still a college student. But Mm -hmm. when I went to go intern at, 
uh, the number one publishing house, they laid down some ground rules and let me know like there are certain things that you can and, and cannot say. So I think that would be my biggest, biggest advice. Uh, have fun with it for as long as you can have fun with it. I'm still having fun with it. I've gotten about one or two publishing contract offers. But when you read the contracts, basically telling me I can't have fun anymore. <laughs> you know, like, and it's not necessarily in a way that you think, but it might be like, okay, well, after you write your first book, you need to have three more done in nine months or three more done in like 24 months or something like that. And it's like, when do I really get to sit with my art? Especially if you're an artist. All artists should know this if you don't, especially for the younger ones. When you have something, people are always going to want to try their best to control it in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Nah. So when you're asking for advice, don't take anyone else's advice before you take your own advice. Don't take mm. anyone else's advice. It's like good that. to hear other people's perspective. Don't ignore other people's perspective because ultimately this is this is your market, right? You have to look at it like every time you're talking to someone, you're talking to a buyer, right? And that's not even mm -hmm. from a professional standpoint. That's from a creative standpoint because the people are who help keep your work alive. Yeah. So you need to remember that too, but you don't ever want to be in a position where you just released a book and now you're reading through and you're like, oh, I should have put this there, but... Jimmy told me to put that comment, you know, like, so mm, yeah. have fun while you're young and don't rush to, if you're good enough, whoever you want will find you. Nah. Believe that. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for that advice. Um, yeah. You, you made me even think about when I was younger, when I was chasing my um, uh, radio career, um, there was a time where what I thought, cause like I, I was, I was influenced by hip hop, right? And then mm -hmm. I, I think in DC growing up, like we heard hip hop, we heard go go on the radio. Um, and I always thought that, like, man, if I was a radio DJ, I'll bring these people in, I'll talk about this, I, I, I'll highlight these records. I got into radio, it was not like that. Like, everything was yeah. programmed. Oh, man. Everything was programmed. I was like, but you know what? We should play. I don't care what you think. We should play. <laughs> and who should get airtime? Like, this is the programming. And I was like, mm -hmm. we literally programming people? Like, and then now that I'm thinking about it, like, it, it is programming, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are the, the radio station, the, the media, that conglomerate that own that radio station. They were programming the what they want to be played and listened to and how often that needed to be played to yeah. repurpose that messaging and that branding. And I was like, well, that's not what I want. All right. Well, then you can find another job. I was like, dang. Yeah. That's important too. <laughs> what you just said is really important though. And, can, and, and people need to know that I'm telling you when I got, when I got my first big time internship for the number one publishing house in the world, Man, you couldn't tell me anything. Man, I was like, I did it. I was like, I did it. I had always wanted to get into this specific company, and I'm working for literally the number one company in the world. And when I got there, it was not what I thought it was going to be at all. It wasn't necessarily bad. It just was not what I thought it was going to be at all. And it hurt. I was sad. I really thought about not writing anymore. But mm -hmm. like you, if you would have let that stop you, you wouldn't be here right now with a microphone in front of you. And okay. I feel the same way about that, that whole working in the book publishing industry, because, you know, sometimes whoever you pray to or whatever you believe in will mm -hmm. take you exactly to where you ask to go just to show you that what you got going on is a little bit better. Nah, so, nah. I but I, you know what I'm, I'm proud of you about um, and, and that you still stuck with it. You, you found a way to make it happen. Like me, I left the whole industry altogether and then started a whole another career route. Um, and then I resurfaced with this podcast um, in 2020. And I remember my radio people who, who follow me uh, and, and I, I support them and they support me as well. And it's like, man, I'm so glad you put back up a microphone. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's so, that's so true. Because, uh, but look, this is the thing, though, right? Because you never know who you're aspiring when you're doing certain things. 
like so for you it might for you you might have a different you might be looking at it from a different standpoint but for someone else they're looking like they're waiting for, you waiting to get back to what you feel like is your purpose but for other people they waiting to be inspired again uh-huh. so that's how i was looking at it when i was working on this last book too i'm in this, on this book right here because I've had messages before where I didn't even know people when they told me that my poetry had inspired them. Or Why? people you have never said know some, who you're aspiring. Yeah. yeah, people have said some. I don't even like the word crazy, but people have said some really out of the Wild ordinary stuff. things to me before. Yeah, about <laughs> just like about how like they gave my mm-hmm. poems to people who are or my books to people who are incarcerated. I have gotten mail before for people who are incarcerated. I've gotten messages from. Um, I know one one of my good friends, Jayla. Uh, she uh, went to Howard. She was on the basketball team. I met her, and she sent me just this this beautiful message one day, and and she just told me, um, that some people have a talent, but I think that you have a really true blessing. Yeah. And I don't, I didn't know her. I never met her before. Never seen her in person. Never. Mm-hmm. After that, we became friends because we continued to speak. Mm-hmm. But you just never know what what. If what you're doing is saving someone else, nah, true stuff. Nah. Yeah, and sometimes you may not n- never know, and sometimes you may not know till later on in life. So yeah. keep doing what you're doing, um, and then shout out to Hu, my my in my hometown. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, I got you from DC. Yeah, Even Man, you, you know. <laughs> And before this is over, man, I just want to give you your flowers too, man, because when you wrote me, I literally was in like the final stage and then I'm like, no one's going to care about this when I release it. That was kind of what I was telling myself. And then when I got your message, I don't know if you saw it, but I had read it at first and I'm like, oh, I got to be getting pranked. Nobody want to interview me. But then like, I went back and I read it, went to your YouTube channel and started looking at some more of your work and stuff. And I just want to say thank you because... I did not think that people didn't want to talk to me about what I was doing because I didn't believe in it necessarily, but I didn't think it was in that same mix of like today's media and violence and mm-hmm. killing and drugs and all that. I'm not talking about that type of stuff. Um, right. So I didn't, it's nice to know that someone who looks like me as well is also interested in the things that I have to say. So I want to give you your flowers because, you know, with platforms like this, you give people hope and give them the ability to continue to stay on the path that they're on as opposed to conforming. So thank you too, my brother. I appreciate it a lot, man. I appreciate that. That means, that means the world to me. And, and, and and as long as there's there's still blood pumping in my veins, I'm going to do my best to create a platform so that we, we have that voice and space. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Nothing but love. Um, Let's end off like this. Tell, Tell people what the current projects, we know the book, the book is one of them, and any other projects that you got going on, where they could connect with you, where they could find you, um, and, and then and sign off with any last words of wisdom that you would like. Um, right now, I do have some second edition works um, that I have, some stuff that I've released already in a collection of short stories that are going to be on my website. Um mm-hmm. Uh, you can find me on Shane Payne Poppy at, um, on Instagram and my nah, business page. More hip hop references there. <laughs> <in. laughs> and my, uh, I like that name, man. Uh, and then, um, <laughs> let me think. Um, I'm going to have, I'm going to have so much stuff coming out. Honestly, right. especially with this drop, I plan on just revamping my entire website. So by the time this, everything comes out, you all, you all see it. Um, but yeah. really, I don't want to shift focus anywhere else. Amir's instant poetry is coming in 2023. It is my debut poetry book. It is more than a book. It is a peephole into my life, into my private life. Um, when we will experience beautiful memories together while we travel down this, this, I guess this time lapse that i've created this time capsule that i've created i should say and yeah the link will be in my bio for anyone to purchase um and support uh we're gonna have a couple of more things coming out around that time i'll be doing a book release event and i'll have um i'll have some flyers out by then Mm -hmm. but amir's instant poetry and uh yeah that's 
That's really all I got for right now, man. Right, I love it. I love it. So y'all make sure y'all check check out my boy. Don't, hey, all the links are going to be in the bio. I'm putting it, everything in there. You make sure you keep us tuned in anytime you're doing a drop. We will be glad to support it and uplift it and amplify it here on Rise Urban Nation. I appreciate you. I salute you, King. Keep doing the great work that you're doing, and let's keep collaborating and uniting our communities. That's it for our current, anytime, anytime. Uh, That's it for our current episode of Rise Urban Nation. Y'all stay tuned, and we'll catch you on the next time.